It is almost 100 years since this beautiful short article called 20 Minutes of Reality by Margaret Prescott Montagu was written. As a child, I was afraid of world without end, of life everlasting. The thought of it used to clutch me at times with a crushing sense of the inevitable and make me long to run away. But where could one run? If never-ending life were true, then I was already caught fast in it and it would never end. Perhaps it had never had a beginning. Life everlasting, eternity forever and ever. These are tremendous words for even a grown person to face. And for a child, if he grasped their significance at all, They may be hardly short of appalling. I do not really know how long the insight lasted. I have said, at a rough guess, 20 minutes. It may have been a little shorter time. It may have been a little longer. But, at best, it was very transitory. It happened to me about two years ago, on the day when my bed was first pushed out of doors to the open gallery of the hospital. I was recovering from a surgical operation. I had undergone a certain amount of physical pain and had suffered for a short time the most acute mental depression which it has ever been my misfortune to encounter. I suppose that this depression was due to physical causes But at the time, it seemed to me that somewhere down there, under the anaesthetic, in the black abyss of unconsciousness, I had discovered a terrible secret. And the secret was that there was no God. Or if there was one, he was indifferent to all human suffering. Several days later, my bed was first wheeled out to the porch. There, other patients took their airing and received their visitors. Busy interns and nurses came and went, and one could get a glimpse of the sky with bare grey branches against it and of the ground, with here and there a patch of melting snow. It was an ordinary cloudy March day, and I'm glad to think that it was. I'm glad to remember that there was nothing extraordinary about the weather, nor any unusualness of setting, no flush of spring or beauty of scenery to induce what I saw. It was, on the contrary, almost a dingy day. The branches were bare and colourless, and the occasional half-melted piles of snow were a forlorn grey rather than white. Colourless little city sparrows flew and chirped in the trees, while human beings, in no way remarkable, passed along the porch. I cannot now recall whether the revelation came suddenly or gradually. I only remember finding myself in the very midst of those wonderful moments, beholding life for the first time in all its young intoxication of loveliness, in its unspeakable joy, beauty and importance. I cannot say exactly what the mysterious change was. I saw no new thing, but I saw all the usual things in a miraculous new light, in what I believe is their true light. I saw for the first time how wildly beautiful and joyous, beyond any words of mine to describe, is the whole of life. Every human being moving across that porch, every sparrow that flew, every branch tossing in the wind, was caught in and was a part of the whole mad ecstasy of loveliness, of joy, of importance, of intoxication of life. It was not that for a few keyed up moments I imagined all existence as beautiful, but that my inner vision was cleared to the truth so that I saw 
the actual loveliness which is always there but which we so rarely perceive. And I knew that every man, woman, bird and tree, every living thing before me was extravagantly beautiful and extravagantly important. And as I beheld, my heart melted out of me in a rapture of love and delight. A nurse was walking past, the wind caught a strand of her hair and blew it out in a momentary gleam of sunshine. And never in my life before had I seen how beautiful beyond belief is a woman's hair. Nor had I ever guessed how marvellous it is for a human being to walk. As for the interns in their white suits, I had never realised before the whiteness of white linen. But much more than that, I had never so much as dreamed of the mad beauty of young manhood. A little sparrow chirped and flew to a nearby branch, and I honestly believe that only the morning stars singing together and the sons of God shouting for joy can in the least express the ecstasy of a bird's flight. I cannot express it, but I have seen it. Once, out of all the grey days of my life, have I looked into the heart of reality. I have witnessed the truth. I have seen life as it really is, ravishingly, ecstatically, madly beautiful and filled to overflowing with a wild joy and a value unspeakable. For those glorified moments, I was in love with every living thing before me, the trees in the wind, the little birds flying, the nurses, the interns, the people who came and went. There was nothing that was alive that was not a miracle. Just to be alive was in itself a miracle. My very soul flowed out of me in a great joy. Besides all the joy and beauty and that curious sense of importance, there was a wonderful feeling of rhythm as well, only it was somehow just beyond the grasp of my mind. I heard no music, yet there was an exquisite sense of time, as though all life went by to a vast unseen melody. Everything that moved wove out of a little thread of rhythm in this tremendous whole. When a bird flew, it did so because somewhere a note had been struck for it to fly on, or else its flying struck the note, or else again the great will that is melody willed that it should fly. When people walked, somewhere they beat out a bit of rhythm that was in harmony with the whole great theme. Mine was, I think, a sort of accidental clearing of the vision by the rebirth of returning health. Doubtless, almost any intense emotion may open our inward eye to the beauty of reality. Falling in love appears to do it for some people. The beauty of nature or the exhilaration of artistic creation does it for others. Probably any high experience may momentarily stretch our souls up on tiptoe so that we catch a glimpse of that marvellous beauty which is always there but which we are not often tall enough to perceive. And all the beauty is forever there before us, forever piping to us, and we are forever failing to dance. We could not help but dance if we could see things as they really are. Then we should kiss both hands to fate and fling our bodies, hearts, minds and souls 
into life with a glorious abandonment, an extravagant, delighted loyalty, knowing that our wildest enthusiasm cannot more than brush the hem of the real beauty and joy and wonder that is always there.